and I will finish up with George Martin talking about his life and himself. My parents weren't musical, but they were very, very creative. My sister was three and a half years older than me and she had piano lessons. I used to copy what she did when I was about four or five and I wanted to have piano lessons too, but we couldn't afford that, so I just made up my own music as I went along. I had a fairy godfather in the shape of Sidney Harrison, a wonderful man who was a very good pianist and educationalist. He urged me very strongly to take up music and he helped me because he arranged for me to have an audition with the principal of the Guildhall School of Music. When you're young, you're not only confident, but damned arrogant. I was full of myself and thought I was terrific. I didn't realise how inadequate I was. There were about a dozen record producers in the country, but then they weren't called record producers. They were called artist and repertoire managers. They didn't really shape events in the studio. Their job, rather like the A&R men of today, was to recruit talent, put them in the studio and give them an opportunity to be recorded, rather like a broadcast. In the 50s, stereo was reserved for classical recordings. You didn't do any overdubbing or editing. When I first went into Abbey Road Studios in 1950, we didn't use tape. We went directly to wax because it was so much better quality. I was 36 when I first met the Beatles and I was an old man to them, but perceptions have changed. They were, on average, 16 years younger than me, so I was a kind of big brother rather than a father. I didn't know them from Adam. They didn't mean anything to me. So it was a bit one-sided when we first met, but they had that idiotic sense of humour that I loved too, and that made me want to be with them. If you haven't got a good sense of humour, life's not worth living. Because there wasn't a rock and roll precedent, the Beatles, when they came, turned everything upside down and made a revolution which I didn't foresee. As composers, they didn't rate. They hadn't shown me that they could write anything at all. Love Me Do, I thought, was pretty poor, but it was the best we could do. Eventually, the floodgates opened in America in 1964 with I Want to Hold Your Hand, and from that point on, it was mayhem. But you see, I didn't spend all that much time with them because they were on tour all the time. Recording time was issued out to me very sparingly. I've got a, quite a few favourite Beatle albums. I like Revolver very much and I like Rubber Soul very much. And I'm very fond of Abbey Road. Probably because it's the last album we made and we kind of knew that. There was an inexplicable presence when all four were together in a room. Their music was bigger than they were. If I had to pick just one, it would be in 1966, the first ever time I heard Strawberry Fields Forever. John played it to me on his acoustic guitar. That moment I shall never forget. It was a wonderful thing to happen and it stays with me even now. I've had a bloody good innings. I can't imagine anyone who's been luckier than I have with the kind of artists I've been able to record. Thank you, Sir George Martin, for your invaluable contribution to music. I've been Magsy Moyer. I'll talk to you again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>